Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we'll look at medical topics in depth. Today in this episode, we shall be focusing and looking at snake bites. These are actually very common given that the rain season is almost upon us. So you need to learn as much as possible from these review lecture videos. So grab your piece of paper, grab your pen, and let's go. Remember that poisonous snakes are pretty much virtually everywhere. And you're going to be having the main families of poisonous snakes being grouped into three main families. You have vipers, which are also referred to as vipery day. They are two subfamilies under this family. You have crotalinae, which are pretty much pit vipers, and viperinae. You also have the second family, which is known as elapidae or elapid snakes. These are fixed front uh, fanged snakes. They also have a subgroup which is known as uh, Hydrophidae or sea snakes. These are often found in Australia. It, they are often considered as a subfamily of Elapidae. Some people may consider them as an independent family. You also have Colub Colubridae, which are pretty much back fanged snakes. So some common poisonous snakes include cobras, crate snakes, and vipers. Common snakes include cobras, russell snakes, the saw scaled vipers, pit vipers, crates, even rattlesnakes. So remember that most of the time, snake bites do not necessarily result in envenomation, which is pretty much being injected with venom. This is uh, because 30% of patients that are actually bitten, venom isn't actually put into their bodies. So when we talk about snake venom, remember that it can be classified predominantly into the types of snake venom, depending on the actions that they have on the body. You can have hemotoxins or hemotoxic venom. These are pretty much going to be causing hemolysis of red blood cells, and they're also going to stimulate the coagulation cascade such that you use up your clotting factors, you use up your platelets, creating what is referred to as a consumptive coagulopathy that may lead to hemorrhage. You also have neurotoxins, for example, fasculins that can destroy acetylcholinesterase. Remember that this is an enzyme that is found across the synaptic cleft and it helps in the breakdown of acetylcholine. So acetylcholine will remain in the synaptic cleft thereby stimulating the postsynaptic neurons or the postsynaptic membrane that may lead to tetany. It may also lead to fasculations. You also have dendrotoxins, which are pretty much going to be inhibiting trans neurotransmission by blocking the exchange of positive and negative ion across a neuron membrane. This is what is going to lead to paralysis. You also have alpha toxins that can bind to acetylcholine receptors and lead to them being inactive and they become numb and this may lead to paralysis because these toxins have a similar structure to acetylcholine. So they will bind to these receptors and they'll lead to uh, muscle numbness and paralysis. Then you also have neurotoxins. I mean rather uh, necrotoxins and cytotoxins. These are pretty much going to be causing damage to the cell membranes. They're also going to be causing damage to the connective tissue. There are certain enzymes that we'll talk about in the pathophysiology of snake bites that are going to be enabling the poison to spread across the tissues and cause extensive necrosis of many cells. You also have cardiotoxins that are often going to be causing arrhythmias that can either cause this irregular heartbeats or can actually even stop your heart. They may also lead to dysfunction on the heart contractility. You have nephrotoxins that may lead to renal failure and myotoxins that of course cause necro necrosis of muscles. And remember that muscles have myoglobin that can often be released into the bloodstream and myoglobin is toxic to the kidneys. So often they may lead to renal failure as well. So we'll begin with the first family, which is the Viperi Day. These are often going to be found in most parts of most parts of the world, except places like Antarctica, Australia, Hawaii, Madagascar, even some isolated islands, as well as uh, north of the Arctic Circle. You also have certain characteristics of the snakes. Remember that they're going to have long fangs, and this is in comparison to non-vipers. They're going to have these long fangs that are hinged and the fact that they are long and hinged means that they can permit for deep penetration and injection of snake venom. So these are actually can penetrate very deep into the skin when you're bitten. There are two important subfamilies. Uh, mainly crotalinae and viperinae, which are pretty much the pit vipers. And the venom which these viperidae snakes produce is pretty much going to be containing many proteases and is predominantly hemotoxic. 
So we'll talk about the crotalids. These are pretty much going to be characterized by large triangular heads compared to their small eyes and, of course, their large retractable fangs. They also have this thermoreceptor, which is known as the pit, that's going to be located between the eye and the nostrils. This allows them to actually sense the heat signature of a prey, and they can actually um, sense you through this heat that you emit, which means that they're able to sense prey even though you're not really um, disturbing the snake. Then... Some examples include rattlesnakes, lance heads, as well as pit vipers, like for example, the Asian pit viper. And so remember that crotalidae usually are going to have a mixture of hemotoxins and necrotoxins, but predominantly it's going to be a hemotoxin. Then viperinae are found in Europe. They're also found in Asia and Africa. They're going to be lacking this heat sensing pit organ that's found in the other um, family that we just talked about. And common names include pitless viper, true vipers. They also refer to as old world vipers or true adders. And the uh, venom is also going to be containing proteases and is mainly hemotoxic. Elapidae or elapid snakes are pretty much going to be endemic to tropical as well as subtropical regions. And members of this family are going to be recognized by their permanently erect fangs at the front of their mouth. And they have a characteristic way of actually recognizing these type of snakes. If you threaten them, they're actually going to display... Uh, this rearing upwards where they're going to be spreading out their neck flap. Remember how the cobra actually behaves when it feels threatened, so it'll lift its front head and spread out its neck so that it makes itself look a bit bigger. So most of these snakes are going to be containing neurotoxins. Some examples include cobras, coral snakes, crates, mambas, sea snakes, taipan, as well as tiger snakes. The first picture that I showed you of the snake on the first slide is actually a coral snake. Then you also have Hydrophidae, which is pretty much a subfamily of elapid snakes. It's also referred to as a sea snake. And these are actually adapted to live solely on uh, in water, rather, and they're going to have this aquatic life. They are unable to move on land except the genus uh, Laticuda, which is pretty much going to be able to move on land, but not as effective as other land snakes or other terrestrial snakes. Now, these type of snakes are going to have this paddle-like tails and many of them are laterally compressed uh, and their bodies are going to appear or give an appearance such that they look like eels. And they are very venomous, but even though they are venomous, most of the bites that result from the snake rarely cause any uh, and, and venomation, which uh, may lead to any fatalities. And mostly the toxins that are present in this type of snakes are neurotoxins and myotoxins. Then Columbridae is pretty much the largest family of snakes. They are found on every continent except the Antarctica, and most of these are not really venomous or they have venom that's not really harmful to humans. However, you get snakes like boomslangs, twig snakes, even Asian genus like uh, Rhabdophys, which are pretty much going to be causing human fatalities. Now, when it comes to the pathophysiology of a snake bite, remember that the venom is going to be produced and stored in a pair of glands that's going to be found behind the eye. And this venom is going to be discharged from these hollow fangs that are going to be located on the upper jaw. And depending on the different type of family that you have of the snake, you have different types of fangs. So the fangs can actually grow to a, a very large size of about 20 millimeters in very large rattlesnakes. And the amount of venom that's actually going to be uh, injected into uh, the prey that is bitten is going to depend on the following things. So it's going to depend on the time that has elapsed since the person was last bitten or since the snake bit someone else or bit into prey. It's going to depend on the degree that the snake feels threatened. So if the snake is very threatened, it will inject a lot of venom. If it's not really threatened, not so much venom. The size of the prey, the larger the prey, the more venom is going to be pushed in. And remember that the nostrils of the pits are going to be responding to this heat emission, like we already talked about, of the prey, which enable them to actually... Um, vary the amount of venom that's going to be delivering uh, into the snake bites. So if the, the heat signature is very huge, it's going to be pushing in a lot of venom into this prey. And remember that most of the venom is completely, mostly water. And it's going to be containing many enzymatic proteins that are going to be causing the destructive properties that we see of this snake toxin. So you have proteases, collagenases, arginine, ester, hydrolases that are pretty much going to be found in pit viper venom and these are going to be of course breaking down components that are found in connective tissue um 
are going to be breaking down collagen, they're going to be breaking down proteins, even some of these are going to be found in cell membranes. Then you have neurotoxins that are going to be mostly found in coral snake uh, venom. You have hyaluronidases, which are going to be breaking down hyaluronic acid and are going to be disrupting these mucopolysaccharides that are very important in the subcutaneous tissue, very important in the connective tissue. So this actually allows the spread of the venom very quickly through the subcutaneous tissue. You also have venom containing phospholipase A2, which actually plays a major role in the hemolysis that's going to be secondary to this esterolytic uh, effect on the red blood cell membranes and is also going to be promoting uh, muscle necrosis. You also have some thrombogenic enzymes that are going to be promoting the formation of a weak fibrin clot, which in turn is going to activate uh, plasmin and then this is actually going to result in the consumptive coagulopathy because you keep... a activating these uh, platelets to uh, activate and form these uh, blood clots and then they are eventually broken down and then eventually you do not have clotting factors, you do not have platelets and of course this is going to lead to hemorrhage. Then you also have protease 1 amino acid oxidases that are pretty much implicated in tissue necrosis. So here is a table. So here you have snake venom that's secreted from the snake of uh, from the snake parotid gland and it's going to be containing of peptides, which are pretty much going to be causing damage to the endothelium of the blood vessel. This may lead to edema and hypovolemic shock, which means that it is very important to give fluids in this patient. Then some enzymes are also going to be present, like protease 1 amino acid oxidase, which are going to be causing tissue necrosis, hyaluronidase, which are going to aid in the spread of the venom through the tissues, phospholipase A2, which is going to be causing damage of the red blood cells, as well as damage of the muscle, so it's myotoxic. And you have other chemicals that may alter coagulation, platelet function, fibrinolysis, vascular integrity changes, as well as cause disseminated intravascular coagulation, which are all going to culminate in hemorrhagic episodes. Some clinical features may be local or may be systemic, but the most reliable signs of en envenomation, I don't know why this word is very difficult for me to pronounce, is severe local pain, you may get swelling, you may get discoloration that's going to be developing within 30 minutes of the bite. If all these things are actually seen when the patient presents, it's most likely that the snake actually put venom into this patient. Then you may get some local effects such as burning pain, you may get edema, you may get erythema, you may get swelling, ecchymosis, even hemorrhagic bulla. You may also get local bleeding, tissue necrosis, ulceration, and to some extent gangrene. Some systemic effects include some neurological manifestations. There may be weakness, perioral um, paresthesia, you may get muscle twitches, you may get shock, you may get bleeding tendencies, pulmonary edema and respiratory failure, renal failure, you may also get some snakes such as vipers affecting multiple organs and soft tissue, cobras and coral snakes are often neurotoxin. Then when you're taking your history of a patient that actually has had a snake bite, it is very important to obtain the history from the patient. Most of the times the history is from the patient, not a bystander, and in most of the cases, Snake bites are going to be resulting from attempting to handle a snake. Uh, so the genus is usually known of the snake or the person usually knows the type of snake that bit them. In some cases, they may not actually see the snake. Like for example, if you're walking at night and a snake bites you, you may not actually see. But for the doctor and for the patients that are living in that environment, it is very, very important to have some functional knowledge on the indigenous fauna that is found in that area because you should know the types of snakes that are common in that area. And it is also very important to note the time that has elapsed since the snake bite because this is a very, very necessary component of the history. And snake bites are very dynamic so they may actually change and progress someone who may initially be fine may deteriorate very quickly and actually end up dying or end up in multi multiple organ failure because you may not know uh, the time that has progressed uh, from the time this person has been bitten to the time that they presented to the hospital so this is going to allow assessment of temporal effects of the bite to determine if the process is confined locally or if it has progressed to systemic signs, as I already told you. So you want to obtain a description of the snake or pretty much if they capture it, even better, have a look at the snake. But of course, be careful so that you do not get bitten yourself. So if it's possible, you should determine the color the pattern or even the existence of a rattle. Remember that rattlesnakes are going to be making that characteristic 
uh, or have a characteristic tail that actually shakes and, and makes a lot of noise. And it's very, very distinctive for you to actually pick out. And remember that most snakes, when they bite you, they're actually going to remain within 20 feet where they had bitten you. So they will be waiting around that area. So you assess the timing of the events and the onset of the symptoms. So inquire the time the bite happened and the details about the onset of pain. When did the pain start? So if the patient actually points out that the pain was actually early and the pain is actually intense, it means that a lot of venom was actually pushed into this person. And you should also ask for some systemic symptoms such as nausea, syncope, and as well as difficulty in swallowing or breathing. You may also determine the history of prior exposure to anti-snake venom and uh, prior, ex uh, prior snake bites that may have happened because this could uh, have been the second or even the third time if this person is unlucky or if they are indeed a snake handler. Then, of course, determine if they have any allergies because this person may actually need antibiotics. They may need anti-snake venom. Then also de determine if there are any comorbidities such as a cardiac uh, problems, pulmonary problems, even renal disease, because this may lead to um, renal failure. It may lead to cardiac failure. It may lead to respiratory failure that may um, exacerbate um, the already existing comorbid conditions. And also ask if you are taking any medications such as aspirin or beta blockers. When you perform a physical examination, ensure that you do a complete comprehensive physical examination. Your vital signs are very important. You should do your primary survey when they come in. So do your airway, breathing, and circulation. You should determine the fang marks or the scratch marks. And if you are dealing with the coral snake bites, uh, if you want to determine the coral snake bite pattern, you can actually express blood from the suspected wound to actually visualize the pattern of the bite or whether there is a bite or there was just a scratch. Some investigations that you would like to do include things like a full blood count with a differential to give you an idea of the platelet count, the RBC level, and the white blood cell level. Then you may also do blood cross match because this patient may need plasma components. They may need fresh frozen plasma. They may need a blood transfusion. You may also order for some coagulation studies like the bleeding time, clotting time, prothrombin time or INR, and activated partial thromboplastin time. You may also do blood urea and serum creatinine as well as electrolytes because this patient is at risk of getting into renal failure. Do a urinalysis and look for red blood cells. Look for albumin in the urine, even myoglobin. Liver function tests can be done to assess the integrity of the liver. You may also order for creatine phosphokinase enzymes, especially in patients that are um, exposed to cardiotoxins as well as hemotoxins that may cause uh, problems with the heart as well as problems with the, the red blood cells, even problems with the muscles. Then you may also want to order arterial blood gases. You want to check for the oxygen as well as the carbon dioxide partial pressures. Now you should be able to ab you should be able to grade the level of envenomation um, in this patient. So if you had you can grade it into three main bits. You have mild moderate and severe. So mild is pretty much you're going to be having local pain. You may have edema. You may not have any signs of systemic toxicity and the, the lab values are going to be normal. Then for moderate uh, envenomation, envenomation, I think that's the right word, envenomation, I think, you may have severe local pain, edema that's going to be larger than 30 centimeters surrounding the wound, Systemic toxicity, including nausea, vomiting, and alteration in the lab values. You may have a hematocrit that is falling. You may have falling platelet values. And then severe uh, type is obviously going to get generalized petechia. You may have ecmosis. You may have blood-tinged sputum. You may have features of hypotension, features of hypoperfusion. That's a delay in capillary refill time, a cold peripheries and of course, a, a very low BP. Then you may also get renal dysfunction. You may have changes in the prothrombin time and changes in the activated partial thromboplastin time and as well as other abnormal tests that are going to be defining consumptive coagulopathy. Then when it comes to the management of snake bites, first of all, I'll teach you about the first aid in case a person is bitten outside the hospital or at any other place where you are. So make sure that you reassure the patient. So keep the patient calm and this is so that you remove any hysteria that may be there. And anxiety doesn't actually 
help this patient. Because picture it like this, once you're anxious, your sympathetic system is kicked into overdrive. Once the sympathetic system is kicked into overdrive, your heart starts beating faster. When your heart starts beating faster, your blood is spreading much faster to that area and the, the toxin is actually spreading much faster. So you also want to immobilize the patients, keep them from walking um, if it's possible, carry the patient, put them on a stretcher because walking is actually going to help the toxin spread much, much faster. You want to do your ABCs, check if the patient's airway is patent, check if the patient is breathing, keep talking to the patient and keeping them calm, distract them from the situation, check if there's any bleeding. If there's any bleeding, compress and ensure that the patient is not uh, bleeding. Then, of course, monitor their vital signs and establish at least one large bowel cannulae. So if you're, of course, in the field, you can't do this. But if you're at the hospital, a primary um, care facility, you may actually put in a large bowel cannulae and start crystalloids. You want to also give oxygen therapy. So keep a close watch on the airway at all times because this patient may need intubation because they may go into respiratory failure. So negative pressure suctioning devices can offer some benefit if they are used uh, within several minutes of the snake bite. So if the um, snake bite has actually been hours ago, then there will be no benefit because the poison has already gone. So do not attempt to make any incisions or give any anti-snake venom in the field. Then all the first eight things that you learn on these TV shows, on the survival guides, about or even in Boy Scouts are pretty much wrong. So do not make any cuts into the wound. Do not suck out any venom. Do not wrap ice on it. Do not apply a tonkate because you are not going to do this right. If you make a cut, you're pretty much opening it up and there may be infections in um, sitting in, in that place. And before you actually get to the hospital, there's an infection that has set in. If you suck out the venom, you may actually um, um, cause the person that is sucking out the venom to be envenomated. So it means that this patient may actually be poisoned. Then do not wrap ice uh, to the area. Do not apply a tonicate because you may not do it right. Then of course, immediately transfer this patient to a a definitive care facility. So definitive treatment, of course, is going to include reviewing your ABCs. So you should evaluate the patients for signs of shock. So things like tachypnea, tachycardia, dry up pale skin, mental state changes, and even hypotension. And of course, the site of the snake bite must be incised and cleaned with as much normal saline as possible. And you should perform some debridement. If there is some necrotic tissue, cut out the necrotic tissue. And if this patient has features of compartment syndrome or features of elevated um, compartmental pressure, like for example, pain that keeps increasing and not responding to the normal conventional analgesia, if there's pulselessness of the limb, if there is, of course, um, pain on passive flexion of um, parts of the limb, then this may be features of compartment syndrome. So a fasciotomy may actually be needed. But this is obviously not done in every snake bites. And then you may also apply a tonicate. But when you apply a tonicate, ensure that you do not block the venous supply. You do not block the arterial drainage. You should only block the lymphatic drainage. And usually this is reserved for the snake bite experts because they do know how to apply this lymphatic tonicate. So I wouldn't actually advocate for them. And then, of course, identify the snake and the patient must be transferred to a proper medical center as early as possible, one that's designated to treat snake bites. And of course, the bite wound should be identified and assessed at this primary uh, care center where they are treating snake bites and, of course, grade the venom that has the amount of venom that this patient has been subjected to, whether it's mild, moderate or severe, because the grading is actually a dynamic process and what you may have gotten at the time the person presented when they were bitten by a snake may actually progress. So you may get a mild um, progressing to a moderate, sometimes even progressing to a severe in a matter of minutes, sometimes even in a matter of hours. So you also want to give a poly anti-snake venom. This is usually a combination of anti-snake venom against cobras, crates, and even vipers. This should be given as early as possible, preferably between the first 4 to 20 four hours and the dose is about 20 to 150 mils depending on the type the severity and the age of the individual generally children get the same doses as adults then you can actually dissolve this in normal saline and actually give it as an infusion of about 500 mils of normal saline to run at 20 drops per minute and of course if the snake has been identified you can give a monovalent snake um 
serum which is actually much more potent because it's only targeted against that specific snake you may also give uh, preferred agents against crotalids which is known as crofab or crofad or which is actually several vows that you can give that are usually needed you also want to uh, give tetanus prophylaxis to prevent tetanus so 0.5 mils of att uh, intramuscular you want to give your iv fluids you want to perform blood transfusions and a transfusion of plasma if necessary cover this patient on antibiotics so generally third generation cephalosporins such as ceftriax are more effective especially on the gram negative organisms you want to catheterize this patient and monitor your urine output you also want to be um, regularly checking their uh, blood urea creatinine bleeding time and clotting time and of course in cobra bites they may lead to neuromuscular blockade and paralysis so you may actually give neostigmine 0.5 milligrams IV every uh, half hourly, so every 30 minutes, and then you can repeat this if necessary, and you're also going to be giving this along with 0.6 milligrams of atropine. So in Viper Bites, DIC is very common, so you want to also give heparin about 10,000 to about 15,000 units as a loading dose. And then you can later give 5,000 units as a maintenance dose three times a day. And you may also want to give human fibrinogen in cases where it's necessary, where you have a consumptive coagulopathy and low levels of fibrinogen in this patient. Complications of snake bite may be local, such as infections, skin loss, cellulitis, gangrene of the part, compartment syndrome, especially with pit viper snakes and then you may also have cardiovascular and hematological complications such as deep venous thrombosis pancytopenia disseminated intravascular coagulation hemorrhage you may have pulmonary collapse septicemia renal failure margulin's ulcers and of course antivenom uh, associated complications such as anaphylaxis which is referred to as type 1 hypersensitivity and serum sickness which is referred to as a type 3 hypersensitivity I really hope you enjoyed learning about snake bites and the next time you see them on the wards or you meet a patient that has been bitten by a snake, you will know exactly what to do and how to save this patient's life. Thank you for listening to this review lecture video. Tell a friend to tell a friend to subscribe to the channel. Drop a like if you haven't. Hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications every time I post such videos. Drop a comment, share the page, show some support to Zambia and beyond. My name is Dr. Moses.